Can you hear me at the back? Awesome. Morning, everyone. It's absolutely glad to be here. Um, this is the first Machine Learning Developer Conference. Uh, I've kind of gone to many conferences, but with the title Machine Learning, this is probably the first of its kind in the country. Um, honestly, it's a great time to be in the industry. If you look at it, you know, all of us hear the term AI all the time, right? And uh, no conversation that ends without we talking. And we are at a conference which purely focuses on AI and ML. So it's, it's absolutely a great time in the industry. And if you're a developer beginning a journey, it can't be a better time as well. So if you look at AI as a term, right? So I'll next. Is my slides on at the back? Can slides come there? OK. So if you look at uh, the industry today, right? And by the way, for the next uh, uh, 30 to 40 minutes, I'm going to give a glimpse of uh, what we think is Microsoft in the field of AI. Uh, you know, we heading is industry. Uh, what's the philosophy behind the very fact that we are out there to democratize AI? Okay, I'm going to spend a bit of time on that. But before I get going, a quick check. How many of you here are data scientists? 10, 15. Uh, aspiring scientists. Aspiring. I thought all hands will go up. Aspiring. With my mic, is it on? Is it working? Okay, perfect. Let's get going. Now, if you look at AI as a term, right? You know, I've been part of a lot of. You can hear me in the back. No, right? Can you get okay with that? Sorry, guys, just give me a sec. Is it working now? Is it working? At the back, can you hear me? For the first time, I've owned two mics, sir. So hopefully, it should work. Okay, so. I spend good time you know, talking to startups, ISVs in the country, uh, about digital transformation, about helping them understand the journey in the field of AI, etc. I think every time we talk about that, I think I get a sense that AI is something which is definitely not an overloaded term. It is here to stay. It has just started, right? Because a lot of it, what we want to do in the world of AI, I think it's been happening for the last three, four decades. It's just that we didn't probably have the right techniques, technologies before to make it happen. Now, if you look at the general sense globally, right, all of us understand that AI is, is a term that you know, we use every single day, whether you like it or not. Right? Every convention has that. These two major conferences, World Economic Forum and CES, which just happened two weeks back, if you look at WEF uh, as, as a, one of the largest, one of the you know, most prominent conference, four terms stood out there, right? cooperation, inclusion, skilling, and AI. These are the four dominant terms in, in that conference, which is, which is perceived to shape the future of the world. Right? That was dominant there in that conference. Look at CES. CES is a conference, probably we always look forward to that, uh, you know, consume electronic show in the Vegas. And uh, a lot of stuff happens in the field of IoT, AI. But this time, uh, while AR, VR wrote last year, this time it's all through AI, right? By, right from autonomous cars. Uh, to predictive models, etc., running in any of these appliances, I think that ruled ruled the show in terms of what happened uh, at these two conferences. So AI clearly has arrived; it is here to stay. But you can't miss the fact that as you as you browse through any newspaper these days, right? Even for the, for, the, for that matter, two days back in Times of India, there was a massive article on how AI is going to change the world, how it is so important for each one of us. It doesn't matter if the techie or non-techie. The fact that you got to be participative in the world of AI is very essential. That means, as an individual, we've got to understand where it's going to take us. Right? So honestly, it is here to stay. And, and more than anything else, uh, all of us work in, 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 in the corporate world. And we probably may not see it inactive in front of us, we being consumers. But it's already made a back to entry into enterprises. If you look at HR, if you look at supply chain, if you look at state processing, they're all there. The models have been running for ages. It's just that we don't see it. Probably it will reach consumers in a little while you know, down the line. 
probably they're all downstream right now, not consumer endpoints yet. Now we're talking about AI uh, for the fact that you know we've reached human parity. Human parity is probably one element why AI is so dominant today, right? When I say human parity, if you look at AI as a research, as a field in, in the field of academia, research has been happening for the last 60, 70 years, right? Now we've been you know churning models, training for you know hours, weeks, and months and years. It's just that it's dominant today because we reach human parity. That means missions have reached. End of the day, base promise of AI is what? You know, making sure the missions behave like human beings, right? So, end of the day, if missions can surpass human capability, I think it's, it's probably calls for arrival of a technology. Now, in that context, yes, AI has arrived for multiple reasons, right? Cloud computing is one, data is second, number of algorithms, right, which are not probably available for end developers to make a call, it's available today, right? It's more, probably much more optimized, simple for us to make a call. Now, human parity probably is the statement, is the foundation why probably AI is becoming mainstream. As Microsoft, the research has been happening for decades, right? All the APIs that you see today, we so called cognitive APIs, it's a, most of the vendors called cognitive APIs, they're all in the making for decades. They're all battle hard, trained on millions and billions of data sets, data corpus, right? And because of the fact that we use human parity, it's out there for us to use it. If you look at these prominent innovations in the industry, I think every other vendor is in this zone. But if you look at a Microsoft research, you now this is something which, which, which probably we led this, I would say, innovation in, in, in all practical sense. Computer vision, that's number one, right? 96% human accuracy, 4.0 error rate. That's something which, which probably, you know, it's been there in 2012, if you look at it. Uh, deep learning as a technology, deep learning as a technique, as an architecture pattern, neural network. Uh, that kind of shot to fame. So if you look at computer vision as a technology, 2012, uh, the accuracy we had was about 40-45% in terms of assessing what we see in front of us and ability for machine to identify what it is as a, as a scene, as a preview, right? Uh, come 2016-17, you know, because of deep neural network, uh, we're able to crack that. If you look at the ResNet architecture, uh, all of you understand, all of you heard ResNet, right? Yeah? ResNet. Uh, one for two layers, deep neural network. I think that's, that, was, that was the creation there, uh, which kind of led Microsoft to lead the momentum in terms of attaining accuracy in, in computer vision. Second was speech. This is an interesting one, right? Speech is something which we, you know, going forward, somebody said this, it will be a UI-less interaction. That means voice dominates going forward. Voice is one aspect which probably will become the mainstream uh, interaction mechanism with, with citizens. Citizen service is a big, big one. You know, India being a multi mill country, imagine if people can't use computers, the best way for them to, for, for us to make them interact with systems are through voice, right? Speech is something which also, you know, we reached human parity in 2016, 2017. Now, switchboard is a data set that was used to crack that. And the next one is, see, look at this innovation, 2016, 17, 18, not too, you know, in the past. It's all happening, in, it happened in the last, uh, you know, two to two, two and a half years, right? Uh, interesting one is uh, translation here. It's probably the most difficult one of the lot, right? People have been building a lot of uh, you know, models to understand this part, but if you look at human uh, uh, ability for human beings to literally translate from source to destination language, let's say you know, English to Chinese, this, the case, for, case in point here is Chinese to English. An essay was given, uh, it is a 2000 word essay, was given to a mission to translate to English. It is also given, it is, the same essay was also given to a human being to translate. The human accuracy is at about 63%. That's what is perceived to be the most accurate or capability of human beings to translate with, with, with the same intensity, with the same emotions, the vocabulary, all the stuff considering, right? So we've surpassed that as well. And the last one is you know, reading comprehension. I think end of the day, if you ask questions to any, any of the digital device today, ability for the device to get back with the response, I think that's what it is. This is, this is again, Stanford Q&A data set where uh, you train it, uh, you know, uh, the corpus was Wikipedia uh, articles, right? You pose a question, its ability to respond back with the right phrase for that question was a test here. So end of the day, we're talking, we're probably having this conference here today because of the fact that AI is mainstream and also for the fact that we reach human parity. Now as Microsoft, you know, we have a very, very comprehensive, sophisticated, I would say, and a simple platform. Probably the comprehension as a term, comprehensiveness as a term, uh, I could not use it two months back. Uh, December 5th, in the Connect Conference in Redmond, in, in, in the US, uh, we announced our machine learning services, which went general availability. 
Uh, I'm going to talk about that, give you a glimpse as well with a short demo. But end of the day, for us as Microsoft, we're thinking about offering a machine learning as a platform or AI as a platform. It has to fulfill the needs of a data scientist. End of the day, we're targeting data science as a stream. And it has to evolve in terms of ability for us as a platform to give you tools and techniques from extreme left, extreme right. right? In the question of you know, building a model training in the cloud, when it comes to certain algorithms, we look at hyperparameter optimization. Right? How do we do that? We talk about building pipelines for even dev tech, or even for that matter in terms of training and, and deployment pipeline as well. Right? Now, deployment is a complex area here, because end of the day, in the world of machine learning, it's all iterations. Experiments are iterations. Right? I'm sure data scientists who are here can agree with me. The, the, the number of iterations is endless. It is the question of, hey, have I got the accuracy which probably is relevant for that, for that domain? I mean, you can't get 100%, otherwise there's no meaning uh, in, in, in uh, you know, V. I mean, it can't be practical and real, right? Now, end of the day, for us to have a platform which is more meaningful, which is more productive, and also comprehensive for data scientists. When I say data scientists, assume for the fact that everything that developer starts, as per data scientists, as well as data engineers, it's end of the day, it's an end-to-end -end platform for them. And that got us to thinking, last two to three years, if you see the way we evolved, evolved as, as a company in terms of offering an AI platform, uh, hence the term comprehensive. I'll take you through one slide which kind of sums up what we offer as Microsoft and how we're, I would say it's a, it's a beginning. All I'm gonna show now, I would call it beginning because there's a lot more in the pipe that's gonna come hit the mainstream. So our AI platform has three broad categories, AI services, infrastructure, and tools. End of the day, uh, for a data scientist or any developer to be productive, you need all these three, right? It's a question of, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a question of making them productive. Now, first thing first, there are certain services. I said, you know, as Microsoft issue human parity uh, on certain services, these, uh, these services have been battle hard trained for, you know, decades, I would say. Uh, probably they were behind Bing as decision engine for a long time. The first one is pre-built AI. That's what we call cognitive, you know, across the computer vision, speech, language, search, and, uh, uh, and, 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 and certain other engines. So now, end of the day, pre-built AI is a term we use because they're black box to you. Their API is given to you as, as, as uh, you know, any of the rest API that you can call and make, it, uh, make a response come back, right? Now, that, that's categorized cognitive services. But interestingly here, the cognitive API is end of the day, you make a call to internet, it comes back with a response, you show it, or you decipher. Imagine you're sending an image of a manufacturing plant. You want to understand what's happening on the plant at any point of time. The response comes back. It, you have to make a call to the, to, to the internet as an API. It comes back and gives a response. Now, every time you can't afford to make a call, right? Something which is, which is very cool that has happened in the recent past. Uh, you know, this is something which probably a lot of, lot of customers love it. In fact, there was a use case that we were talking recently where one of the customer came up and said, hey, I want to, uh, this is a customer who probably have a lot of cameras on uh, highways, right? Let's take uh, Yamuna Expressway. They have a lot of uh, you know, CCTV cameras there to track the movement of vehicles. They wanted to do you know, number plate recognition. That's a common use case, right? Number plate recognition. Now, our, our OCR API is quite effective. It's, we, you know, engineering team is optimizing it for that use case. But the point is, I can't be hosting in the cloud every time you can't afford to make a call, right? You being a remote location, you may not even have connectivity for that sake. So how to deal with the situation? So we offer the same APIs in containers, right? That's the, that's the I would say that's super cool innovation that has happened. Same APIs that you've always, you'll, you'll probably use that in the cloud. You make an API call. The same is available to you offline in a container which you could deploy to Edge. So we call it Edge scenario here, right? Edge can be any device, uh, it can be any IoT device, I would say, any sensor for that matter, which has, which has capable to host a container or a mission. Imagine the toll booths on the highway, right? I mean, you may not have connected at times, and hence these APIs uh, are packaged as containers are available to you. That's, that's something which, which is very new, and it's probably the key differentiator here as well. Conversation AI, second one, I think that's a bot, uh, bot service of ours. Uh, I'm sure all of you have kind of, this is, I would say, this one area which, which is mainstream today, because every website you go, every interaction endpoint you see, uh, you have a chat bot which is helping you to uh, you know, uh, have those conversations before an agent comes, comes to uh, the main floor. Well, I'm saying cognitive on these aspects, but a lot of scenarios demand you to build custom models, right? And that's where a custom AI, uh, custom ML service, uh, you know, is dominant there. Uh, we'll double-click ML service in a little while. 
But uh, this kind of completes the picture, right? As a developer, you don't need to know, understand data science to make an API call, you make an API call. Uh, even for the building a bot for that matter. If you're a data scientist, you need to have a fine control on model development, uh, you have ML service as it, as it available. Uh, another important aspect is, you know, infrastructure. End of the day, for your model to come alive, for the model to actually take shape, uh, you need massive compute, right? Uh, luxury of Azure here, Azure compute, uh, you know, virtual missions. Uh, FPGA is something which is also getting traction. Uh, this is a collaboration with Intel. It's called Project Brainwave. Uh, it's a question of you know, getting GPU power at a CPU cost. Right? That's a sweet spot. That's what we're looking at here. Now, it's a complete, if you look at the infrastructure, it's a complete, uh, you know, I would say it's a complete portfolio in terms of giving you a data platform. And AI, as such, it sits on top of that. I would say this is probably the key differentiator or a key uh, you know, metric here in terms of you attracting the majority to use your platform. That's a tool set, right? Uh, I'm not sure how many of you use Visual Studio Code, VS Code. Yeah, good. In fact, this is a fact. VS Code is the world, world's number one IDE today. It's open source. It runs on Ubuntu, Mac, and, and Windows, right? In fact, Google uses VS Code internally as well, right? It's a very, very powerful tool. Uh, supports multiple languages. End of the day, you know, for us as Microsoft, as I said earlier, democratizing AI is the foundation. In that context, we're giving you tools and techniques which probably are very familiar to you as a data scientist or a developer or any open source developer today, right? So here, there is no, honestly, in, in all the stuff I'm showing here, there is no proprietiveness here at all. We're embracing open source like nobody else, right? In fact, our mainstream tool in the cloud is Jupyter Notebooks, which I'm going to show you in a little while from now. Uh, from a deep learning standpoint, we support every other deep learning framework there. Cognitive Toolkit is ours. TensorFlow, Cafe, MXNest, PyTorch, name it, and Keras, we support it, right? Out of the box. Uh, and in fact, some of them are optimized for GPUs uh, in the cloud. Now, this kind of sums up our platform in, a, in entirety, right? Right from giving you tools and techniques for a developer to make API calls, for which you don't need to have data science skills. You don't need to understand data science or you don't need to be a data scientist for that. As a regular developer, if you are thinking of infusing AI, infusing, let's say you want to identify, you want to do attendance management using face API, you don't need to do data science for that, right? The API is available, you just make a call and get done with it, right? So from that till addressing an advanced machine learning practitioner who needs tools and techniques and compute and algorithms and a DevOps life cycle, everything is addressed here as a platform, right? That's why I call it, while we said, it's a simple platform, it's a sophisticated platform, it's also a comprehensive platform, which addresses the needs of every single developer in the ecosystem. So far, so good? Yeah? Awesome. Now, looking at, looking at uh, some of the services, I'm going to give you a glimpse of a few services, right? End of the day, uh, while, while I show slides, I also believe in, in showing what I tell, so I'll show you a few things as well. Now, I said cognitive, right? Cognitive is an API, it's a black box to you. End of the day, you can't tweak. There's no algorithm exposed to you at all. It's an API call. Now, there are scenarios where you might say, hey, while you trained your, let's take an example of a computer vision, right? You trained computer vision as, as an API, as an algorithm on a generic data set. It is, it is across. For example, if you look at any of the image, ImageNet as a, as a repository, it has, it has over 2,000 or you see it has over two, two, 200,000 labels, right? Uh, categories, I would say. Now, I might have a category which is outside of that as well. Let's take an example, manufacturing plant, right? While you might give me a face API which recognizes people, recognizes scenarios, recognizes etc. Can you give me an API which recognizes objects, right? Can you give me an API which does classification, right? Now, custom vision API. Now, it's a computer vision API and we also have the custom vision part of it. That means we open a small window there. You know, it's an API for sure, it's a black box. You can't go through it, you can't see the algorithm, but we open a small window where you can train, or rather you can, uh, you can train that model on your images, right? It's, it's interesting thing, right? That's where we use transfer learning as a technique, right? So you can have as less as 40 images. That's the minimum images we want, 40 images. The scenario is like this. One of the customer came in and said, hey, I have a manufacturing plant. Right, one of the largest uh, automobile uh, manufacturers in the country, uh, and as people walk in, a lot of contract workers in the morning, and the need of the hour is when when they walk in, I want to make sure I won't let anybody inside without helmets. That means my API should be able to recognize people who are not wearing helmets, or rather, give me a sense of how many wearing helmets. 
Now, for you to build such a model, it's going to take a while, right? So, custom vision API of ours lets you do that. I'll just quickly show that. For this, by the way, you don't need data science skills at all, right? All, I'm, all you have to do is upload images, click on train button, and evaluate that, right? These images can be as less as 20, 25 images. 40 for classification, 20 for object identification. I'm going to show you object identification here. I'll quickly switch to my browser. Uh, okay, this one. Now, I said custom vision. So all I've done right now is I've, I've uploaded about 40 images. 20 is all minimum you need. And I've tagged that, okay. Um, I can just quickly show you training images. I just took random images from uh, you know uh, from Google, by the way, and I've just tagged that in terms of where helmets are here, right? These are all people wearing helmets. Okay, I'm going to do a quick test. I'm going to just browse some file locally. This probably is a very common scenario on Indian roads. We'll see if it identifies helmet, right? Look at this. It tells me there are four people, but there's one person wearing helmet here. It puts a bonding box and it gives accuracy as well. End of the day, there's a ground. You would have put a bonding box saying this is where the helmet is. How accurate the model predicts in terms of its ability to put a bonding box exactly there is also something you can test, right? The simple example I wanted to show in terms of where, where we're heading as a company end of the day for us to democratize AI, we also need to cater to your private scenarios, your scenarios from business standpoint, right? And by the way, this is going to happen for most of APIs. Well, this is one API I've shown you, which is a computer vision API taking a custom vision avatar. Uh, for example, there is speech. I'm not sure how many of you have tried speech on, on uh, uh, Microsoft. You can have your custom voice, right? We give you two characters in terms of male and a female voice. But if the voice has to be yours, very easy to train that, right? Again, transfer learning technique applied there. Now, I mentioned this earlier. This is the exact scenario. I want to just show it in terms of, if you look at typically in a cognitive API scenario, cognitive uh, in a public API scenario, the need of the R for me there is to identify number plates as well as people in the car. That means face API and OCR are both coming into the play. I want to identify how many are sitting in the car and what's the an, what's an number, uh, registration number of that particular car. Now, I make a public API. I make probably face API and OCR two calls. It comes back, puts a bounding box, I get the response. But it's not practical, right? You know, if you have to make millions of calls every single, in every single toll booth, it's, it's not practical and it's not going to, well, latency is something which we, none of us like it, right? In that context, we can deploy these APIs into container, and there is no connectivity between the container and the cloud. By the way, the only connectivity will be for billing. Okay? It's the same billing that happens if the API were in the cloud. Okay? Uh, this, is, this definitely is something new and, and uh, uh, you know, pretty cool that way. ML Studio, again, this, I would say this, this, this was there. This has been there for the last four years. right? It's, it's not new, but it has grown from strength to strength. This is probably one tool, uh, and, and again, and I can probably say this as Microsoft, if, if we do one thing really well, that's giving you the most productive tooling experience, right? Now, take anything, you know, take Office as a suite. It's an example of that. But ML Studio, again, if, I mean, you should know, uh, you, if you're a beginner as a data scientist, because you should know how to build the pipeline, right? You should know which algorithms to use, when to use, and how to do transformations, how to do pre-processing, all the stuff is, should be known to you. Then the tool becomes very, very sophisticated because end of today you want an environment where you can build the model and host it instantly. End of a lot of people struggle in hosting. You know how many of you use Flask? Flask, yeah. So all of you use Flask to host it, but end of look at it. You build a model without clicking, without doing any programming. Can you deploy it? Answer is yes. I'll quickly take you through ML Studio. Right. Uh, by the way, I'm on a 4G network. Yes, if I'm, I'm not going to refresh any screen. I just did it for uh, computer vision. It worked great. But I've just loaded a few experiments here for your reference, right? Uh, let me close this, right? Um, yeah, it's, let me move it to the side. So I have a simple auto, automobile you know, num, uh, uh, price prediction model here, okay? Uh, in terms of you selecting, you know, in, in ingesting data, selecting a few columns, doing transformations, running a regression model here, everything is all drag and drop. There's nothing, nothing uh, you know, more to that. Um, if I look at here, if you want to just do, right, uh, all the classification uh, regression models are available here. You just drag and drop it here. There's no 
big deal. You should know which one to drag and which one to use it, right? As simple as that. But the best part is you have an option to deploy it as a web service. No need to use Flask, right? Deploy, one click, it goes as a web service. It can be classical web service or RESTful API both, right? That's the beauty. ML Studio is that way. Uh, I would say it's, it gives you the sophistication, simplicity, as well as the tool set to give life to your models. Now, before I get into ML service, that's probably the data scientist uh, world where if you're an advanced ML practitioner, uh, this is what you aspire for. Now, quickly, if you look at, this is basically the, the end to end life cycle, right? You basically ingest data, you do transformation, pre-processing, all those activities, uh, and, and one of the important activities is switch engineering, right? Switch engineering is the most difficult, I would say, in terms of making sure you make your data model friendly, right? Now, another activity which you, which probably is much more harder is hyperparameter tuning. For any algorithm you choose, the number of iterations you go through, for you to arrive at certain accuracy which is acceptable to you in, in real. So hyperparameter optimization is, is again a very, very complex area, right? I mean, when it comes to, uh, when it comes to uh, deep learning problems, this becomes probably the most complex activity between you because I, I would rely on uh, the, the neural network to surface features anyway, but otherwise this becomes the most complex thing. Now, keeping this in view, this as a backdrop, if you look at automated ML, this is something which I'll, I'll show you in terms of how it works, but uh, the first offering under the umbrella of ML service automated ML, okay? Now, I said feature engineering, you ingest data, right? You do feature engineering, you do pre-processing. Pre-processing is an ML experiment, right? It's an experiment as part of that, you do that. Uh, Hyperparameter optimization is another key activity here. Uh, as, as part of uh, the, 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 the algorithm, uh, I would say category, we support classification, regression, forecasting, uh, you know, no clustering yet, okay? And eventually you get the output model. So if you look at the middle portion, which is ML experiment, probably that's, that's where data scientists spend significant time. You might use data engineers to give you some, uh, you know, you, you might work with them to address transformation, a uh, bit of pre-processing, pre pre etc. But when it comes to the middle box, I think that's where data scientists rule. That's where your experience matters a lot, right? I mean, data scientists here, you agree with me on that? Yeah? Perfect. Now, this is where we take over, right? This is where Azure Automated ML does things for you. This is also a way for data scientists to validate whether the algorithms they're thinking will work makes sense or not, right? Look at it. I'm, this black box I put here is Automated ML. That means, let me just switch to my Jupyter Notebook here. That means um, I have a... I have a simple, uh, by the way, this is called Azure Notebooks, right? Nothing but Jupyter Notebooks, no difference. It runs in the cloud. It's a free workspace. Uh, you can, in all of, you know, any of you can do that. But this is what happens. I have a simple, by the way, I have to specify here, if you look at, look at it here, the screen has become smaller. Um, I'm sure you can see at the back, right? I've said, these are my auto ML settings, automated ML. That means I have to key in what are my basic, criteria for automated ML to run. I'm saying use 30 iterations, okay? That's a the number there. Metric is SPMN correlation. That's what I want to validate my models against, right? And, and of course, I'm saying it's a regression problem. By the way, I should know that, right? Whether it's a regression problem, a classification problem, I should know that upfront. And, and here I've already defined my X and Ys, okay? The X variables and Y variables, Y output as is defined. I'm, sp I'm saying SPMN correlation. I'm saying it's a regression problem. Now, click of, when I run this stuff, look at this. It actually runs through all of the regression algorithms and gives you the best model. By the way, it's, it eventually ends up giving an ensemble model, right? Most of the time, if you look at the bottommost, 95.87 is accuracy. It's an ensemble model. But look at it. That's the ease at each, which I get. Now, by the way, you can go and see it. Huh? You know, while I'm saying it's giving you all the stuff, you can actually go and see the model performance here, right? This is the run I had yesterday night. I'll just show you in terms of um, uh, what experiment this is. Back to experiment. This is Azure uh, workspace in Azure portal. That's what you're seeing right now. And uh, I have quite a few runs, but yesterday night, Jan 29th, if you see here, it's night, I, I, just had a, I just ran this once just to make sure that I get the latest uh, or if even differentiated output. And if you look at here, um, it actually gives you stats of all the models here. I can go and click on that particular run. If I want to go and check on this run, right? We talk about model explainability, 
right? You can actually go and check what happened here. What's the, you know, RMSC for that matter, root mean square error, right? You can check all the stuff here. For every single algorithm, it is given certain accuracy. By the way, you might not choose the ensemble that you might say, hey, you know, for this problem, uh, the, the, the gradient boost uh, algorithm probably, you know, fits, fits the bill. You can choose that. But it's a great validation of data scientists uh, to understand what models to use and, and when to use that. Now, this probably is the acme of, of our innovation in, on, on ML service today, as we speak, right? This is, this is typically, you can call it as a, you know, DevOps life cycle for a data science project from preparation to experiment to deployment, right? Now, this is where you offer notebooks. By the way, all this is completely open source, right? There are no tools that we have mandated there. For example, VS Code is something which, which as I said, it's already become the world's number one tool in terms of people using it. But look at it. Azure Notebooks, nothing with Jupyter Notebooks. You can train the models on local compute. You can have your own you know, Jupyter Notebooks. You can use Anaconda and do that, or VS Code for that matter. And the best part is for when it comes to training models at scale, you need remote compute, right? These notebooks are in the cloud, and you can use your notebooks to actually communicate to your models, or to a script saying, hey, run the model against this type of compute in the cloud, right? You can use CPUs you know, all the way, or GPUs if it's a deep learning problem for you, fast track, faster response and accuracy. And that's not it, hosting and managing, right? That's the hard part. So, by the way, we have, we have uh, the Azure ML as a library for uh, you know, Python, Jupyter Notebooks, right? So you can use that directly, and every single task that you ever do in the ML's life cycle is done in that. We also have data prep library available as well for pre-processing, transformation, etc. This is, this is the beauty I said, right? End of the day, we have the most comprehensive Azure DevOps. Now, imagine you're building a model, right? You built a model already, based on the automated ML I showed, or even your regular model development using uh, you know, machine learning services. Uh, and whichever model you feel is an apt one, you register that model, right, and save it. Save that model, probably a pickle file. And that's when Azure DevOps kicks in. If you have a pipeline built in for you to take that model after it's been optimized, after, you, you, uh, after it's acceptable to you from an accuracy and precision standpoint, DevOps comes in and deploys to production as a web service. And again, it's all containers. You have an option here, by the way. If you look at, if you look at building models at scale, you have an option available where you can deploy from an image. You can save the model as an image. It becomes a Docker image, yeah? And these are four or five options you have in terms of uh, deploying or scaling your model. By the way, we'll go a little deeper. I'll show a few demos in the masterclass later today. Uh, but these are the options available. Azure Content Instances. I mean, if you just want a simple hosting in a, in a multi-tenant environment, you can do that. Uh, we support AKS, uh, right, which is Kubernetes Services. I mean, these are the skills that you already possess as data engineers or infrastructure experts in terms of deploying your uh, functionality and, and services. So no different than that. Project Brainway mentioned earlier, that's FPG offering from us uh, in collaboration with Intel. Uh, that's something which is in the preview. You can absolutely sign up for that if you have a scenario where you need uh, FPGA uh, chips from a deep learning problem standpoint. Uh, of course, the last one is edge scenarios, which typically I showed an example of containers, right, which fits the bill here. You have a device which has compute available to host a container and no better option for you to take the same containers there as well as here. In fact, one thing I didn't show you earlier uh, when I showed uh, the custom vision is, hey, how do I, how do I uh, take this model? I said we opened a small window where you can train on your local images, right? Now, this is your private images trained on a battle-hard API already. If you take that model to the edge, we have an export option here. Look at this. This is the beauty, right? It gives you a compressed model. I can take it to iOS, I can do it to Android, I can probably import on TensorFlow, and ONNX, I'll talk about that. It's open neural network exchange. It's, it's again interoperability from a model standpoint. And finally, Docker file, right? So a uh, cognitive API, like a computer vision, opens a window where you can ingest your images and retrain it and take the trained model of a certain accuracy and deploy to edge network, right? So that's the, that's the beauty here. Now, these are the four or five options available for you. But at the end of the day, what is critical is, as Microsoft, we always taken the stance, I mean, more so in the last four to five years, where we, we embrace open source like nobody else. We lead open source contributions globally, right? Be it GitHub, even before we acquired GitHub, we were the leading contributors to GitHub uh, in terms of open source, open source code. Now, ONNX is, is a collaborative experiment. I would not say experiment, it's an initiative formed by Facebook and Microsoft 
to ensure that the model, for, by the way, Facebook, you know, you know is, cafe is from Facebook, right? Cafe 2.0 right now. Now, end of the day, it is about interoperability when it comes to these models. I might use Cognitive Toolkit. You might use TensorFlow. So can they coexist in terms of the actual model interoperability? Answer is yes. And uh, this ONNX as a format helps you export model in the form which can be interoperable across the board, right? It's almost like containers. I'm agnostic of any compute, right? I can take it anywhere. That's the philosophy here. Now I've spoken about you know, quite a few things here, right? End of the day, it's a very comprehensive platform. But if there is one example of an app, which probably is a classic manifestation of all the cognitive APIs, that is Seeing AI app, right? In fact, the seeing, uh, this is available on iOS. I'm sure quite a few of you own iPhones, right? Yeah? No? Yes. yes, yeah, wonderful. Now, all of you are awake, right? I'm like going full speed from last 20 minutes. Okay, sure. So now if you look at seeing AI, this is also, see, end of the day, uh, as Microsoft, we have, we have a side of Microsoft which is, which is empowering. If you look at the vision statement itself, right? Empowering every person, every, pers every business on the planet to achieve more. Now, this is one simple example of what we build for people who, are, who have less vision or no vision for that matter, right? I'll show you a quick example if it connects here. There's always a demo which, which needs me to screen my, uh, yeah. So this is an app which is right here. Now, I'm Short in 4G chance. network, mind you. So this app has multiple things, right? All these are cognitive APIs, by the way. Nothing is locally programmed. No model exists other than probably currency, which I'll show you. So it can Document. be documents, etc. But let's do a simple scene preview. scene preview, right? I'm going to just take a picture here and see what happens. Processing. Right? Now, API call is made to the cloud. It should come back. A laptop computer sitting on top of a table. Yeah. Pretty cool, right? So this is live. So this is... Thank you so much. This is basically, this is basically, um, sorry, sorry, hold on. Yeah, so this is, this is basically for people who have no vision. Imagine they're walking and, and it gives you a preview. And recently, you know, I must, I should have kept it. Recently, we actually released something called Currency Classifier, okay? So I have a few notes here. We'll see how it reads that. Now, this is where the, 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 the host, Localizing the model comes in the picture. I showed you custom vision, right? Where you can export a model onto your iOS. So this is one such example where you train a classifier and uh, you can see if currency. it identify currency, right? So this is again for people with no vision. Uh, 500 rupees. It recognizes, right? This is an old note. Five rupees. Perfect, right? People who have uh, no vision, this becomes uh, like a, ma this, this is transformational for them, right? Uh, in fact, I, I know a few people who are visually impaired and, and they said this is this probably make them even more independent. Otherwise, generally people who are no vision they keep notes in different different pockets to identify those currencies. Okay, so we'll move on. Um, now, as I said, as I said, end of the day for us, uh, you know, as Microsoft, what is important is also to to make sure we transform the world. AI is a AI is a technology. AI is a field, uh, a branch of computer science uh, has a profound impact on society, right? Uh, this is this is something which we're doing as Microsoft. There is AI for good, AI for social good. Under that umbrella, we are AI for humanitarian action, AI for Earth, and AI for accessibility. There are massive grants available for startups who wish to solve, take up a very very profound problem in the society and solve it. A lot of startups have come forward to do that. As Microsoft, we are we are absolutely working through thick and thin to make sure AI can be leveraged across the board to make a massive impact on you know human lives. I'll play a short video which kind of sums up our approach as Microsoft, what we're doing, and the power of AI uh, for humanitarian aid. Let's play the video. Human rights situation often deteriorate very quickly, and the faster we can get the information and we can react to the situation, it can be a real game changer. New technologies are advancing so rapidly and technology companies can advise us on how best to use those technologies to protect and promote human rights. The 
objective is automatic damage mapping because after the disaster, the government needs the damage map to carry out the effective rescue. If we can save the time to grasp the ground damage information, we are able to save a lot of life and facilities. In a new partnership with the World Bank, United Nations and tech industry partners, we'll be better able to predict when and where famine will occur. Operation Smile's vision really syncs in with what I feel is a fundamental human right. What the volunteers do for the children may seem like a small thing, but they are able to change the lives of the families forever. We're creating a chatbot-based experience for refugees coming out of the Syria conflict. The purpose is to have displaced youth find a way to discover and access learning materials so you can engage directly the course content. It's just the beginning of the impact that we hope to have with the tools at our disposal. See, end of the day, it is about leveraging technology for the right cause, right? Uh, there's also a, a topic called ethical AI. I'm sure all of you should go through that. I have a short uh, I mean, URL for a book that you can download, which is a free book from Microsoft. But, but look at the video. I think everything that we are building as a technology a platform, uh, it's also keeping in mind how we can impact human lives, how we can impact society uh, at large. Uh, I think that's something which we are super proud of uh, as a company and would love to partner with anybody who have a solution in those three areas, right? Uh, accessibility. Earth as well as humanitarian aid. Now, I've kind of given you a high-level glimpse, I would say, very high-level glimpse in terms of what is the AI platform, what is the width and breadth of the platform in terms of helping developers, uh, aspirant data scientists, and advanced ML practitioners to build the solutions. Now, this is, again, and I've been, um, I just uh, finished my post-graduation in data science, uh, and I've kind of gone through, gone through the journey of understanding the platform across the board in terms of the depth, breadth, and the ability for me to be productive. And I would say, as a developer, it's definitely a developer's dream. I'm not saying it because I'm Microsoft. I've tried everything else as well. Uh, but if there's one platform which stitches a story from, from data ingestion till model deployment, management, and hosting, I think that's, that's the platform we have today. And of course, for data scientists, definitely it's going to be paradise because there's nothing that we've left. By the way, it's just a beginning. A lot of data scientists are working with us to give feedback, right? Even if you experience something while, while I'm saying all this, any feedback, make it come away. Write to me. I'll be absolutely glad to take it to engineering because engineering uh, team to a large extent sits uh, in Bangalore. It sits in Hyderabad. Uh, we have access to them and we can absolutely pass on feedback. I think if there is, if there is a, a very, if there is a startup, startup culture is agile. They're always open feedback and, and they're very fast. They help go to market, etc. I think probably the biggest startup that I've experienced is Microsoft. You know, we have a startup mindset in taking feedback and making it live. Now, if you look at, I said ethical AI, right? This is one book I recommend. This is again, you know, authored by Brad Smith and Harrison from Microsoft. Uh, this is such a profound statement, right? End of the day, you know, we all know what computers can do, but what it should do is the question. Now, this, you can look it up in Google or Bing. Uh, it's a PDF, free PDF available. I highly recommend that you guys read it. It's not a Microsoft book. It's a book on AI, okay? And which helps you understand the journey that AI has kind of uh, come all the way and the future in terms of what happens going forward, what is our stake, and how should world looks at it. Right? Uh, we're, seeing, we're seeing a lot of debate happening in terms of the pros and cons of AI, right? In fact, in, in World Economic Forum as well, there was a talk about uh, how should AI be used, what's the policy around AI, right? Imagine, as a mission, if it takes decision, what is the governance model for that, right? How do you question a mission for actions taken which doesn't favor a scenario. So a lot of you know, rough edges in that, in that context. Hence, I would say AI has arrived, AI is here for sure, but long way to go, and policymakers are busy you know, penning in terms of how uh, the world should look at uh, you know, AI. But end of it, it's all data, right? If you, you saw GDPR you know, come alive. Now, all the policy that happens around AI is all to do with the data, correct? Now, I highly recommend that you uh, check on this book. But otherwise, thank you so much. Uh, this has been great. In fact, there's one uh, resource I would, I would recommend. 
uh, AI school. We have a booth outside. Uh, you know, you can check out the resource there. But it's otherwise, aka.ms slash AI school. If you are a data scientist or as data scientist or developer, it's a great resource. I would say it's for as per data scientists to understand what is AI and what is machine learning, etc. So with that, thank you so much. You can write to me here. Any questions you have? Otherwise, you guys have a wonderful conference. Thank you so much.